everyone. Welcome to Coffee and Conversation. Where's your coffee? If you have it, raise your coffee. Um, I have my Cushman coffee. I couldn't do without it. Um, it, it. It has definitely saved me through the pandemic. So welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Representative Mindy Dom. Um, with you, I, I am Claudia Pasmani, Executive Director of the Amherst Area Chamber. And with me is John Page, our Membership and Marketing Manager. Um, say hi, John. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. We will be recording today, so uh, we can share with others who could not join in today's conversation. So I just want to <coughs> remind you of that. Um, and I'm just going to tell you, this has been a tough week. I mean, I hope you're all doing okay. How's everybody? Give me a hand out there. Like, how is everyone doing? Eh, sort of, uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like this was a definitely, particularly really tough week. Um, but when I hear... Uh, when I hear our guest's name, I cannot help but smile. Mindy has just been such an incredible, trusted ally during this pandemic. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Mindy. Mindy Dom, our state representative, who is who represents our third Hampshire district, Amherst, Pelham, and uh, parts of Grand. So, um, and I just want to say a few things about Mindy. And, and just because I know most of you know her, she is a 20 year resident of, of Amherst. And I knew her also through more recently um, through her work at the Survival Center. She's passionate about food insecurity um, and uh, you know access to food, clothing, healthcare, wellness, community, and a variety of assist assistance. But um, you know, obviously she's working on serious legislative matters. And I just wanna say, she has just been an incredible partner throughout this process. So um, I'm going to let Mindy talk, but, um, and Mindy, you can start wherever you want, but we, I know we talked about uh, sharing a little bit about how some of our successes together and what we've worked on together um, and what you helped us achieve, but also, uh, and then move into sort of what you're working on now. And then hopefully a little bit about like future. So a little bit of, you know, what we've been doing, a little bit of present and then a little bit of future. How does Absolutely. that sound? Thank you so much. And thank Thanks you for, being here. John, for doing this, for hosting these conversations. Um, for waking us up early and <laughs> getting us moving early. I, and also for all your work, which I will talk about. And good morning to everybody who's joining us. This is so much fun. Um, I hope we have question and answer and a, more of a conversation, but I'm happy to start it off. So I think, you know, when about a year ago, right, uh, we're all aware that the pandemic sort of, the emergency order has started in Massachusetts and um, the governor says, you know, button up close the economy, um, get home, take care of yourselves. And about a week or two prior to that, Amherst really felt the brunt of the pandemic because the university and the colleges closed and our economy is completely linked to higher education. So um, my point has been from the get-go is that Amherst experienced the economic impact earlier than most places. Um, we had a little bit of an advantage in a way that sounds odd. And I think it's because because we dealt with and confronted the potential loss of a college with the year before that, when Hampshire was facing some uncertainty, we had a sense as a community, I think, and we had already started to look at what is the economic impact of being a host community. And we started that conversation of discussing what it meant to be economically a host community to higher education. And so some of that, I think, we were able to sort of bring with us in the pandemic in terms of not only in our conversations with state officials who we already had started that discussion with, but amongst ourselves. But that doesn't really explain the incredible, I think, local energy and heroism that I'm really going to attribute to both the uh, chamber and the bid in responding to the economic crisis that was caused by the public health crisis. Um, Claudia, John, Gabrielle immediately sort of pivoted and said, how can we help our businesses and how can we help our um, employees and didn't make a distinction between the two, which I really want to stress. Um, not every community is lucky, I think, enough to see that, to have these sort of business-based organizations see their role also in protecting employees and families and community. And ours does, and that's something I think to really value. And so they immediately, you know, you all, I mean, you know this, you pivoted and you created, you took an organization that you were creating to look for the future sort of um, events, the Amherst Foundation, and immediately said, we need to start raising money 
to support our businesses. And um, that's just phenomenal. I mean, I took my lead actually from you. Um, I, I probably would have still wanted, I probably would have gotten into more fights <laughs> if you hadn't done that. But because you were leading on supporting our businesses, that was my role too. And also, again, businesses as well as employees and seeing the two is connected. That if a business goes, if a small business closes, there's a whole staff, employees, families, and community that gets affected by that. So how do we pull together to protect that? Um, so in terms of the pandemic and the economic impact, you know, I, I, I sort of look to my predecessor who, um, two predecessors ago, Ellen Story, who had these economic development me meetings. Um, and they had stopped for a while, but I thought, well, the pandemic is actually a good opportunity to sort of restart those um, so that we can check in with each other and see how is, it's less about economic development, it was really about economic impact. And so Claudia and John, you know, you played a big role in those meetings as well as Gabrielle and the bid, but we brought lots of different um, players together, lots of different stakeholders, the higher ed institutions, the cultural institutions, the town, um, and really sort of sat at the same table and just went around and said, what are you seeing and what are you doing about it and what support do you need? And that was incredibly helpful to me because it created my to-do list um, for my district. In addition to holding food security meetings, which were separate from that to kind of find out what were people seeing on the ground in terms of families and kids um, needing, having basic needs. I wanna also kind of, if I can give a hat tip to the town here because not only were they part of those meetings and continue to be part of those meetings, but their health department and our first responders have been amazing in um, not responding to the economic impact, but responding to the public health and personal impact. Um, and Claudia, I wanna tell you that if you're having a really bad day, um, I don't think they want an audience, but one way to kind of get out of that bad day right now is to go to the Department of uh, the Health Department's vaccine clinics and see the fire department, EMS, community members, retired medical personnel, um, everybody joining together to celebrate our ability to take care of ourselves and to protect the health of our community. And then people also sitting in chairs getting vaccinated. Um, that I went this week to the teacher clinic that the health department was having. And I, it was just what I needed. It was like, a, it was like springtime. Um, just to see everybody coming in to get vaccinated is so important right now, but also to see how our community was pulling together to make it accessible, familiar, fun, um, and available to people. And I'm committed to making sure that that clinic gets the vaccine that it needs so that it can continue to provide that to people. Um, I wanna put in a plug for that if I can. If you are eligible for getting vaccinated, please don't delay. Um, the, another town entity that's been an incredible hero in this um, process has been the Amherst Senior Center. Um, you know, Senior centers are created to meet the isolation needs of our seniors as well as other services. And when the pandemic hit because of the age group that's directly impacted needing to basically really stay at home and protect themselves, as well as all these services that they provide that bring people together now had to be reimagined because people were not allowed to get, come together. The senior center has been amazing at maintaining a lifeline for our seniors. And um, though some of us in this early part, early age group don't like to admit it, their senior age group is 60 plus. Um, and so if you're not thinking you're our senior because you're like in your early 60s, you're considered a senior in terms of their services. And right now, if you're having trouble getting a vaccine appointment, you can call the senior center um, and put yourself on a list. And they have a staff person who is unbelievably getting people securing vaccine appointments locally for people and doing it within like 24 hours. So I've heard from a lot of constituents who have had problems getting appointments. If you live in Amherst and Pelham, you should call the senior center. If you live in Granby, you should call the senior center. Um, and they've just been phenomenal. Um, but please don't delay. I know people, some constituents have said, well, I, I won't get mine now, I'll wait because I know I want teachers to get them first or I want grocery workers or farm workers to get them first. They'll get them. We are in a race to achieve herd immunity. 
every person matters in that race. It's not really about you being immunized. It's about the community being immunized. I mean, it's also about you, but the race is really about the community reaching this level. So if you are eligible, please don't delay. Um, and think of it as that's what you're doing for our community, even, and then it's what you're doing for you. Um, so I wanted, I, I guess I went off track there a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the community heroes because I think one of the things that we really need to recognize is in this unprecedented health emergency, unprecedented economic crisis that resulted from it. And the fact that it's not yet over, we're still trying to make our way through it. We have had incredible community heroes. I'm actually looking at many of them. Um, you know, Jeff Harness is here from Cooley Dickinson. Um, they like readily agree to like create a testing pop-up um, in the summer after the Black Lives Matter demonstrations to make sure that people in our county could in fact get testing in addition to everything else that Cooley Dickinson is doing, which is immense. I'm looking at Sarah from five colleges who's been actually leading an effort to bring all the higher ed institutions together so that we could keep updated on what was happening on those campuses. Sarah Barr from Amherst College, who has, you know, Amherst College has done a great deal for their campus in terms of sort of setting a precedent on how a campus can be aggressive in trying to um, limit um, infection and so many others. So I just want us to also just take a moment during the pandemic to say, we're doing okay. Um, we're doing actually probably better than okay as a community to respond to the needs on our, whether they be our very local needs like on a campus or in our institutions and in the broader community through the chamber, the bid um, and making the town and making sure that we are, that we thrive, that we um, survive um, and that we end up stronger than we were before. And I think we're going to be through the efforts of all of you. I'm gonna pass it to you, Claudia. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so much of that that I wanna uh, <laughs> break down. I think um, it's so true because none of this happens in isolation. All of It's all great partnership. And as you said, everyone here, we've all worked with uh, almost all of you in some way, shape or form to make things happen. But I wanna go back to um, the Senior Center for a minute because we've been had the pleasure of working directly with Mary Beth Ogilwitz, who I do want to give a shout out to, who runs our, our Amherst Senior Center, and she has just been un, un you know, just, un, un, she's just immovable when it comes to supporting our seniors and getting them access, getting food delivered, lunch delivered daily. Nothing has been interrupted. Services have continued. Um, but beyond that, we've been able to see and work with her in the health department weekly because of a supplemental budget that I know, Mindy, you fought for. I feel like Early on, we started that fight, I want to say way back last, you know, last May or June. And, uh, but that earmark finally came through at the end of the year. So yeah. if you can talk a little bit about that and what that developed into. I actually, am very, I'm, I'm thrilled that Amherst has really benefited from a lot of state resources that have been earmarked around the pandemic and earmarked meaning sort of like designated for pandemic response. Many of which I want to point out, if I can just say one thing in terms of businesses, would I don't think we would have gotten as much money as we've received so far were it not for the chamber and the bid helping small business, well, encouraging small business to apply for grants and then helping people actually do it. These grants were not easy grants. It wasn't like a you know, five line, yes, I need help. It was like, it's a substantial grant and small businesses have no experience writing grants. So um, if it wasn't for the encouragement and direct assistance, I don't think a lot of those grants would have gone in and the ones that went in wouldn't necessarily have been filled. So I just wanna point out that in Amherst, I think there's been over 50 um, businesses that have received COVID-19 specific emergency grants totaling over $2 million. That, that's separate from CARES money and everything else. That's just small business relief that I attribute to the chamber and um, the bids assistance. Um, I'm thrilled that those businesses received it, but I don't think that much money would have come into the area had it not been for it. So one of the things, because I sort of recognized, and I all of us did, that we experienced it, that Amherst had gotten kind of clobbered by the economic impact earlier than most places in the Commonwealth. And it's because of our status as a host community. So it sort of feeds into that sort of, a, um, information and awareness that is actually in my interest to try to promote anyway as a representative during the pandemic and after. Mm -hmm. um, 
I very quickly sort of pivoted my role to sort of speak to that issue whenever I could to whatever secretary I was speaking with and whatever State Department um, I was speaking with and including leadership in the House. And so when supplemental budgets or economic development bond bills came through, I sort of used it as an opportunity to talk about the early impact in the community and then also what our community needed. So you mentioned the supplemental um, budget, the particular COVID, the most recent COVID-19 supplemental, which was tied not just to CARES money, but also state money. We were able to get two earmarks for Amherst, one for the Amherst Survival Center and one for Restaurant Relief, which I wanna talk about because um, the two are connected as it turns out because of the way the chamber and the bid use the restaurant relief money. So the um, one earmark was for $200,000 for the Amherst Survival Center, which I think was one of the largest earmarks for a quote unquote food pantry um, in that budget. But of course, we all know the Survival Center is more than just a food pantry. So, um, and they used a lot of those funds to create their outdoor shed that allowed them to distribute fresh food in a safe manner throughout the pandemic, which is, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to drive by their parking lot so you can see it. Um, but the other one was for $55,000 for restaurant relief. And we did not specify how, we just said restaurant relief and it goes to um, the chamber and the bid. And the chamber and the bid created this program of using state money to buy meals from local restaurants that then would be distributed to people who were facing food insecurity, the delightful dinners. I think that's what it's called. Um, and I just want you to know, this is like when you created it, it wasn't conceived of as a national program, but now people talk about it, these kinds of programs on a national basis. And that program I think has been going on, first it was started with CARES money with the town, I think in December, and because the supplemental kicked in this fiscal, this calendar year, we've been able to use that $55,000 to extend it. And that's an indication of not only, I think, how unbelievably creative um, our community is, but how we look for these win-win situations where we can take resources from the state designed to help one community and say, well, you know what, how can we take that and like double down and have it spread to another community. And um, all the credit to you for not only organizing and implementing that program, but then using state resources. And I'm hoping we can get more money for that program because there probably will be another supplemental budget for the American Rescue Plan coming through the legislature. And I'm hoping there'll be an opportunity for legislators to create more um, amendments for local services and we can get you more money on that because that's just, an incredible com program. I did it one night with you and Gabrielle and it's it's a beautiful thing to be able to know that a hundred meals are being purchased from a restaurant twice a week in Amherst as a way to provide those restaurants with relief and that that money is going directly to feed our neighbors. So thank you so much for that. Uh, firstly, <clears throat> Mindy, it was because you asked us what we needed. And I wanna make that clear that it didn't happen just by accident. It was, you said to Gabrielle and I, what do you need? What do businesses need? We outlined what we needed and you made it happen. So I do think that, um, you know, uh, this is part of what the work of a state representative really means is, you know, that we look to you to say, okay, here's what we need. Here's what we're seeing. So I want to remind everyone here, like this is the role, right? That we, and that the chamber too can play to make things happen. And so that's, that's, um, you know, the process working, <laughs> right? That's really like at, at its best um, when, you know, the point, Claudia, I mean, I, official well, <laughs> comes to you. When I, when I ran, I said, I'm an advocate, right? But I can only advocate when people tell me what they need. Right. So um, it's it definitely a partnership of listening and people participating in that conversation. Yeah. And I can also say for the d Dinner Delights, and then we can move on, but the Dinner Delights program um, literally is an absolute delight. <laughs> and I'll say and I'll say it twofold. One is because we started in December and then we're able to carry it through January, we're still doing it April 1st is the last dinner. Um, and, we, and it also was lunch for 300 for the Survival Center on Fridays of the month, those three months as well, plus the two dinners for 100 um, members of the community. And what I love is, first of all, we had to go back to restaurants, right? We don't have a ton, so we're going back to them. And they didn't want the money the second time around. They were so proud. 
oftentimes they would deliver and families would be already waiting. Like they would be ready um, with their bags to bring their food home. And sometimes kids would come. So, you know, it was really for them realizing, oh, okay, like maybe I'm doing okay. And, and somebody's not like, it was just such a, such a moving piece, you know, to be part of. And of course they get, they kept the check, but we, you know, it was just really beautiful to see um, people just understanding just the depth of this dual health and economic crisis. So this was just such a beautiful marriage of the two, you know, helping. And then the restaurant next door, for example, like Fresh Side has done it. And every time I go in to order lunch, because we're in the office three days a week, they're like, no, 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 um, I don't want you to pay. And I'm like, well, no, that's why I'm here <laughs> to support you. So, um, because they're so grateful for their participation in the Delights program. That's such a good <laughs> It just keeps dovetailing, you know? It's like, you know, <laughs> through giving, you end up getting so you don't want to get when you get yeah. really. And also, I mean, the people I've met through this program, um, we've served, um, you know, we're working directly with the families, delivering those meals. So Gabrielle, and again, this has been a completely shared, uh, so I want to make sure the bid, this was an equal opportunity. <laughs> and we've been both delivering meals. And it's just been such a gift to meet families, meet the kids, um, and uh, just know that there are families out there who really are struggling, and this is a way to get, you know, get that help to them. And I want to shout out. I just want to say one thing, Claudia. Shout out also to Family Outreach of Amherst because I think they're the nonprofit that you work with on that. Yes, they identify the families that. Um, so a lot of newly, if this was originally uh, newly affected families by COVID. So a lot of this, which is exactly what I was going to share, is that a lot of these folks um, could have been, you know, laid off as a result of COVID and this is why they're receiving this benefit. So they're new to, um, they're not maybe used to asking for help or used to going for food and may not go for food even though they might need it. So this was a really great way to get them access um, to food. And also the woman that worked with us from the senior center, she was actually uh, brought in through CARES Act money. And again, that was designed to rehire people who lost their jobs due to COVID. She's been an incredible resource in Deanna um, and she's on her way to work in the health field. So, but I also wanna remind people that Emmer Survival Center, they're the frontline workers. They've been working the entire time. Um, they have not been vaccinated and I believe they're actually um, they're eligible. Now. They're eligible now, yep. Right. Um, and I know we're also working because of this relationship, I really feel like it again built us uh, a, a much stronger relationship with the senior center, and they are also managing a portion of the vaccine, as as Mindy mentioned. And so we're now trying to work out a way to get directly to our restaurant workers because they are now eligible. But there's a little, there's a lot of fear in that community, um, and for some, for some, there's a lot of language barriers. So how to get them to build trust to get them to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually what we're in active conversations about right now um, with the bid, the chamber. Uh, we have a list of, you know, our, our marching orders to get to those restaurants and to the staff to try to get them um, inoculated. And it's not just, it's not just, um, you know, there's missed been a lot of information out about the vaccine. Um, if someone's an undocumented worker, they might be fearful that uh, this would, you know, bring something to the fore. So, you know, that this is completely confidential and um, would really build capacity for our restaurants. Cause we've seen, we've seen restaurants close for two weeks for cleaning, <laughs> for deep cleaning. And we know what that means. Like that, you know, um, you know, COVID has really uh, scared a lot of our restaurant workers. And you'll see still that though they can reopen, many will remain closed indoor until they can do outdoor dining and keep that indoor dining closed. So even despite the fact that that's a detriment to them in terms of economics, it's the only way they see a path forward. But I think the vaccines will also help and give them, a, I hope, a higher level of comfort. So it's kind of exciting to see that that's, you know, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the vaccine rollout that's happening, Mindy? Sure. You had, you had so much in your last email that was really exciting. Well, first of all, I also want to point out that the vaccine is free. So nobody should be asking anybody for money for that. There is, when you register, if you go online, there's a whole section on insurance, which actually you can skip. First of all, it takes a lot of time to fill it out. And this, the way the um, governor has created the process, you might miss out on an appointment if you sit there 
and put all your information and it's not really necessary. You can still get the appointment without it, um, but it's free. You should never be asked for money for um, in terms of a vaccine. So, um, you know, I think that the pandemic has really, um, from the very beginning, I recognized that my background actually in the HIV AIDS epidemic was probably going to come in. Um, I was gonna use a lot of my experience in that epidemic and um, work and knowledge. I worked in that for a very long time before I was at the survival center. So, um, and I think that has happened. Like I, I've seen things that have gone on with the pandemic in Massachusetts that have made me worried because it's sort of repeated some of the things we shouldn't have been repeating from the AIDS epidemic. One of them might be like um, centralizing services instead of decentralizing them. But I also think it makes me probably more outspoken <laughs> than I otherwise would be, which is either a plus or a minus, depending on if you want to hear me, what I have to say. But um, one of the things that I realized about maybe at the beginning of February when 75 plus year olds became eligible for the vaccine was that probably the most important role I could play for my constituents was in fact to provide them with regular information on the vaccine. That it wasn't so much that I was a great storyteller or that I was a great information sharer, but that was part of my role. That as a representative, I needed to make sure that I was, I was making sure that whatever information I had, I was sharing with constituents. And so I do that through an electronic newsletter that people um, can sign up for. You can either email me directly at mindy.dom, D-O-M-B, at mahouse.gov. Go onto my website at www.repmindydom.com and sign up. And what was a monthly newsletter has ended up being at least a weekly and sometimes more than once a week, depending on information. Um, feedback that I've received from people has been um, not terrible. <laughs> like they haven't said enough. We don't want to hear from you anymore. I, in fact, people seem happy and uh, grateful that they're getting it. I want to shout out volunteers who helped me get that newsletter out. You know who you are. Um, and because it's a, it's, you know, writing a long newsletter or even not even a long newsletter in the middle of a week sometimes can be very hard for me. And I'm grateful to the volunteers that helped me get that out. So right now in uh, Massachusetts, we're at sort of this, um, we're at a real fork in the road, I wanna say. Um, we're expecting a lot more vaccine. So all the excuses for not having a great vaccine rollout that are, that are tied to a limited supply will not be able to be used pretty soon. Um, and we have the, like, the bare minimum of a regional wide infrastructure, but one that really hasn't been supported by the state to the extent that I think it should be. We also have these mass vaccination sites. We have seven of them throughout the state. One of them is in Western Massachusetts in Springfield. And the governor seems to want to be directing and channeling as many people to those sites as possible. They have the biggest capacity for immunization. Um, and that means also, I'll be very frank with you, they have the biggest capacity to generate numbers. And met, you know, metrics are different depending on where you wanna look, but the optics are really good when you can say that you've uh, immunized thousands of people a day. They're not the most accessible to people. Um, in fact, uh, you know, a lot of people from Amherst don't wanna travel to Springfield. We're told that you know, by, as the crow flies, you know, no Massachusetts resident lives further than um, 30 miles from a site. And I guess that's true, but we're not crows. We, we travel in cars and on roads with other cars. And like, you know, it doesn't take people from Greenfield 30, um, it's, it doesn't feel like a 30 um, minute trip to uh, Springfield because it's not, it's oftentimes an hour. So they're not accessible and they're not accessible to people who don't have private vehicles. Um, I want to just say that I don't want to bash the administration with this. I just want to point out, um, and I, I really want to kind of clarify this, that in a public health program, we need to be concerned about numbers of people who are participating, barriers that they face, and then making sure that pe everybody has access and that we're meeting people where they're at. And it can't just be one or the other. It can't just be, we're just going to do numbers and we won't worry about the people who can't get it as long as we're getting some numbers that we can actually show. We also have to look at barriers. And I feel that we should be using this part of the pandemic in a couple of different ways. One, our resources should be to be strengthening our public health infrastructure, not just now, 
but after the pandemic. We should be looking at ways, this should be a wake up call that we need, we've neglected our public health infrastructure and we should be directing resources that strengthen it. That's the first piece of that. And the second piece of it, and this is more touchy feely and I usually don't get go to this place, but I do feel that at this stage of the pandemic, it should be a celebration. We should be celebrating science. We should be celebrating the researchers that brought us the vaccine. We should be celebrating our ability to take care of each other. And we should be celebrating our community's ability to facilitate that. And so for me, that means really also supporting the hyper local sort of clinics that can exist. Not every town wants one, but these regional collaboratives that have been created like Northampton and Amherst have created, they should be supported. Because when I see people coming into the Amherst site, they're happy to be there. They know the people who are immunizing them, they're familiar, and that leads to vaccine acceptance. And right now, maybe we're not so worried about vaccine hesitancy because everybody's so eager to get a, sh um, a shot, but when there's lots more vaccine, we may start to see some vaccine hesitancy. And that hesitancy may prevent us from getting to herd immunity. So we should be supporting whatever we can now that helps prolong vaccine acceptance. And I think that's gonna happen on the local level, not at uh, Eastfield Mall where you may be standing outside on a line in the cold waiting to go in or where there's no public health person overseeing anything. Um, so I sort of, I do feel that not supporting the local vaccination sites, the regional collaboratives right now, robs us of an opportunity to come together as a community. We've all been separated. This is the time to come together and say, we can see each other. I mean, people are like, this is the social time is getting vaccinated. Um, and we should encourage that because that's the way we are going to build ourselves to be able to not only withstand this pandemic, but to get stronger. So when the next public health emergency comes, we have the infrastructure in place and we've, we've paid attention to it. So I'm sorry, that's like a roundabout answer, but right now 60 plus year olds are eligible to get vaccinated. So if you're 60 plus, I encourage you to get pre-registered. There's now a pre-registration process. There wasn't one initially. Um, if you think back, it's been about six weeks since vaccination started in Massachusetts. The way people schedule these appointments has gone through a lot of changes and improvements. And those improvements have come because constituents have expressed anger and frustration at what the state was providing them as a process, which gave legislators like me the information that we needed to advocate for a better system. That's why I keep telling people, let me know what your experience is because it's making us better advocates. Um, and so constituents who tried to get on and couldn't, they, they were, you know, went onto a, a website that crashed, all of that helped feed like the content of our advocacy. So now one, you can pre-register and I encourage you to do it. You may not take the appointment that pre-registration will provide you with, but at least you're on a line. And I really maintain that people wanted to know they were on a line. This constantly having to go back to the computer and see which site has, it was ridiculous. It was not only unfair and inequitable, it was disrespectful. It was, that's not the way to run a vaccine program. So the, the pre-registration program puts you on a line. You may not wanna be on that line. You may get word from the Amherst Senior Center that you have a space in Amherst that takes you out of that line. That's great, but put yourself on a line. Um, now the website also has all the sites in Massachusetts that are um, on one place. So you don't have to go to like 30 sites to see who has availability. Um, that's a plus. Um, we have in Amherst, we have ability to go to three sites, right? We, have, we can go to many more. You can go to any site in Massachusetts, but three, I would say kind of local sites. Springfield is not really local, but that's our local mass vaccination site. We have the town of Amherst Regional Collaborative. We also have UMass, which is a bigger site than the town of Amherst. And they post their openings on Fridays at four o'clock online. So if you're an Amherst resident and you're eligible for vaccination right now, I'm thinking you should be able to get a local, a local um, shot in the arm. And if not at those sites, then at the pharmacies that are providing them. And the way to do that, I'm gonna repeat from the earlier, is if you're concerned about, I don't know where to go, the Amherst Senior Center is here to help you. And they have a staff person who's dedicated to trying to get you an appointment and has been successful. When I asked Mary Beth, so what's your track record? 
She's like, well, we've got over, close to 800 people appointments. We go through the list. Everybody on the list gets an appointment within 24 hours. Get yourself on that list. That's a better list that, that, that's more effective than the pre-registration process. I th you can do both, but I can tell you, I put myself on a pre-registration list last week when we first opened, I got my first email saying, thank you, we don't have any appointments, but we'll keep you informed, which I love. I love the notification, but I'm not expecting to get an appointment from that list for a while. So get yourself on the MRS list. Um, but the rollout's problematic. So if I can just say a few more words, I wanna be mindful of the time. I was so excited that I was appointed by um, the Speaker of the House to this newly formed committee on, that's an oversight committee on COVID-19, emergency pre um, preparedness and management. Our Senator, Joe Comerford, who is also chair, the Senate chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health is the chairperson for the Senate side on that committee and the House chair because they're House members and Senate members and it's kind of like being at Thanksgiving, trust me. Um, and <laughs> the House chair is uh, Representative Bill Driscoll whose background is in emer emergency um, planning and management. And we've had two oversight hearings so far with the administration to look at the vaccine rollout. And here's what I've learned from the testimony as well as the documents that have been provided to us and some of the investigative articles that have um, appeared in the Boston Globe, which I've posted on my Facebook page because I know a lot of people out here don't read the Globe regularly. So there's one thing, public health has been preparing for this kind of emergency for 20 years, since 9-11. They have an entire what's called playbook on how to go about developing, delivering vaccination on a local scale. That playbook has been ignored by this administration. They've decided to go a different route, which is a privatized route. And they have contracted out. So like all the mass vaccination sites are all contracted with private companies and they get most of the vaccine. So whatever vaccine Amherst isn't getting, it's going to the Springfield site. Um, and in my opinion, it looks like they've privatized our response. They've privatized our public health response. And that's not only something to discuss philosophically, like is that the role of government to privatize what should be a government job, um, but they've also done it at the expense of our local health departments. Like a lot of local health officials across the state are they're, they're wondering why. They're ready, they've got, it. they've got capacity, they've got staff, they've got, they've got their plans. They're waiting like literally for the baton so that they can go in the next lap and the state has not given it to them. So that's one thing we have to really look at is what's going on with that. We started the discussion this week um, at the first hearing. We continued it this past week with the second hearing where we had local health officials talk about from different parts of the state about what they have in place, but they just haven't been um, put into action. Um, I think that they should be. I think public health is called public health because it's a public role. Um, and I think we have plenty of public health people in Massachusetts that quite frankly could have been hired last March to be starting to think about these kinds of things. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. I think that um, the, the basis for why the playbook has been ignored um, is not we haven't gotten to the um, complete information about why they've decided not to look at that playbook. I think I'm hoping that we'll have a third hearing and we'll be able to look at that. Um, the other piece that I think we have to look at in terms of the rollout is the populations, because I know people are worried. There's like, so what's going to happen on April 19th when the whole general public gets to go in and we can't even get appointments now? How much longer is it going to be? And it may be a while. I think people have, we all have to be patient until these appointments open up. Um, part of that is going to be part of that is vaccine supply. That is not the whole answer. I know that's what we've been hearing routinely from the Boston. I don't think that's the whole answer because the other part is how do we administer it? What's the infrastructure for delivery? Not just supply, but delivery. And we have to get the delivery piece online now. That's another piece of why we should be supporting local health settings right now is because we know the more you practice, the more efficient you get. And we want these local health um, clinics to be as efficient as possible come April 19th, because that's when they're really gonna be, I would think, 
put into action because when the general public can come in and we've got plenty of uh, vaccine, we're gonna have to open up as many appointments as we can. Um, and so we're gonna have to, as on the state level, we're gonna have to keep pushing that. Um, on the community level, I think everybody is doing exactly what they, what they can do right now. Emma Dragon at the health department has really sort of led this effort to get local vaccine clinics and homebound clinics going. Yesterday, the governor announced that they're gonna start a homebound um, clinic uh, series throughout the state. Amherst has already been doing that, thanks to Emma. Um, and so if you know someone who's homebound, they should definitely be in touch with the local health department. Um, but locally, we've, they're waiting for the baton. On the state level, legislators have to make sure that they get it. Did that answer your question, Claudia? <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. That was so informative. Um, it's really important. And so I have one more question. And then um, if folks want to chime in or have questions, we welcome that. So this is more of a conversation. But um, that's what's going on now. And I want to look a little bit towards the future. Uh, the chamber. This whole time in what has been sometimes difficult has viewed um, recovery as well as survival as um, co-occurring rather than one after the other. So if you would just take a moment to share things that the legislature is working on now or just thoughts you have about how we are going to come out of this economically. Oh, well, I think Amherst actually is gonna be um... So I look at my district and I look at the state. The state is, I think we're gonna be okay to tell you the truth. And I think a lot of that happens to be what's going on in Washington. Um, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I can be very political as, a, as an elected official, different than my prior life and working with nonprofits. But um, I think if we had a different president, I wouldn't be able to say that. I think that the American Rescue Plan is gonna make a big difference, right? We're already seeing that I think the Mass Municipal Association has sort of estimated that like Amherst may be getting direct aid of like about $11 million. So there's direct aid coming to municipalities and then there's a lot of money coming to the state to help not only reimburse for expenses as a result of the pandemic, which have put people into deficit and debt, but also looking toward the future. So I think um, economically, as long as we can kind of support this, the federal government, which can deficit spend, we can't providing funds to states and localities and then press, make sure that the state is also being as responsive as it can be to the current needs for individuals as well as communities. I think we're gonna be okay. And I think the state's done that. You know, we're like just yesterday, right? This, we met for a session for like 20 minutes to pass a bill for unemployment insurance relief that gives relief both to employers and employees. So on the legislature's level, we're continuing to say, so what do we have to fix so that people are okay now? And then our economic bond bill and some of the, and what we'll do in the budget this year for next year is really gonna look at what do we need to do in the next year? Coming out as in economically though, I think it's going to be not just how do we do in um, 2022. I think we'll really have to look at what are we doing from 2022 to 2025 because Next year, I think we are still gonna feel, be feeling the impact of the pandemic, not only in what it's causing right now, but the impacts of what has resulted from it. And what I'm thinking about particularly there are issues around mental health um, and mental illness, as well as mental health care for our students and our kids. Um, higher ed is gonna come out with some uh, significant deficits in terms of money because of what they've had to put out um, in terms of um, resources, testing, PPE, all of this kind of thing. So I think it's really about keeping the pressure on the state to continue to be responsive, which I know we're all in. I mean, this is, this is the best democracy gets because our small businesses are our constituents, right? We're not talking about like the big box stores. We're talking about restaurants. We're talking about mom and pop stores. Um, and so the, I know on the legislature's end, it feels very committed to making sure that we're meeting immediate as well as long-term needs. There's an effort right now also to look at how work from home changes the economy and the workforce. And so I think there'll be commissions that will be looking at that in an expedited fashion, to tell you the truth, like in the next six to 12 months, so they can come back with recommendations for us. We're looking at, yesterday I was at like a regional transit authority caucus, where we're looking at not only how to support RTAs through um, what they've experienced in the past year and what they expect to in the next year, but how to look to the future 
particularly around work from home. So we're looking at, you know, what do we want our communities to look like after the pandemic and how can the state support it, whether it's new libraries, new schools, you know, uh, how, how do we make a future that's resilient and, and really meets the needs that we know we have now and that we've learned we have had because of the pandemic. So, you know, broadband, all of those kinds of issues are now up to the forefront. And I actually think I'm very reassured that the legislature will deal with these because we dealt with them as a concern telehealth. We did um, legislation to sort of expedite that. A, a need that emerged in the pandemic is urgent, but one that we knew we've had for a long time. And I think that may be what happens, John, is that a lot of these needs that we've identified have become urgent in the pandemic. And so we'll be shifting to be able to support them. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Which is almost, you know, we, we have found some silver linings, right? That unfortunately it expedited things that we knew were huge issues and, and access issues. And so it's just expedited all of that, which I'm, and it also changed technology and advanced us in many ways. So it's really- I just want to play out one thing though. I, I don't want to, I don't want to leave it as just a, I agree in silver linings and I am a big believer in trying to seek those out. And actually Mary Beth at the Senior Center, I think is the expert at doing that. I get a lot of motivation from her. Um, but I also want to point out that one of the things that we've also seen in this pandemic is how inequitable it affects yes. different communities and how inequitable government's responses to those communities. Um, and I have a bill with uh, three other legislators called the Vaccine Equity um, Bill, which is really about looking at the hardest hit and most vulnerable communities in the state and making sure that they get disproportionate resources, just like they've gotten disproportionately hit. And some people have said to me, well, you know, how do you feel about that? Because it may mean that a town like Amherst doesn't get what you want them to get because it's going to Chelsea. Well, guess what? Chelsea needs it. And Amherst knows that. And the way I know that Amherst is supportive of that is through places like the Amherst Survival Center and the Delightful Dinners. Is we, and the, the response that you were talking about, Claudia, that restaurant mm -hmm. owners have. No, 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 I want to give this. Um, I know that they need it more. That's who this community is. I know someone needs it more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not, you know, I'm not worried politically about that, but I think that is something that we're gonna have to watch very closely in the next couple of weeks is how are we making sure that the hardest hit communities and individuals are getting the services, whether it's language access, vaccine access, transportation access, all of those issues and how they combine to our response for the pandemic. Wow. Okay. So this is a lot. Uh, please, Mariah, I'd like to open it up. Mara, is it Mariah? Hi, this is really giving me a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm very grateful how, how comprehensive the response has been from the chamber and from Mindy. I mean, this is a very complicated issue and it's so delightful to read your newsletter with, with thoughtful news that doesn't twist my brain like the last four years. I'm very grateful to be in the bluest bubble here. And I know it's really not like that for many people. And Amherst is not perfect, of course, but I think we're doing a hell of a job. A, an idea flew through my head that it might be nice, and maybe this is already done, but to have some kind of site or page that celebrates the community heroes and what they're doing mm -hmm. and also challenges what the challenges are so people can be excited about what's being done but feel or think of ways they can participate mm -hmm. i'm also struck by the news now that i'm not seeing so much covid in hospitals anymore and, and i know people are still dying it, there's been this big swing and and people are you know want to celebrate and i know back with the spanish flu nobody talked about it afterwards because they're just so glad to be done with it we're not done with it um and people will be affected for generations um because of poverty and so forth so i really i appreciate your comment mara because one of the things i've been thinking about in the newsletter is to have like a certain section that's just sort of like a shout out to community heroes um because I think you're right. I think it, it inspires us, right? I'm very inspired by the people that I'm meeting and it's, it's part of the silver lining in our resilience is recognizing that we have that resilience right here. In terms of hospitalizations, I don't know if Jeff wants to talk about that representing Cooley Dick, but I know that 
in the past two weeks, we've started to see an uptick in the number of cases um, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. And hospitalizations, I think, have increased a little bit. I don't know if Cooley Dick has experienced that. Um, and and it is being discussed because it's exactly what you don't want to see. This is why we're in the race. And the race is not just against variants. It's apparently just against transmission. I don't know if Jeff wants to say anything. I'll say a few words about that. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> I believe the highest we ever reached was 21 patients positive with COVID at one time. Over time, that number went all the way down to zero and remained there for many days. But um, at this point, it's gone back up and two, three, four, five would be pretty typical at this point. So uh, clearly um, we still have plenty of COVID in the community and need to remain vigilant. While I have the floor, can I ask a question and make a few other comments? Um, <laughs> so you mentioned restaurant workers and, and uh, concerns about getting vaccinated. And we certainly uh, know that is true of other fields and, and some of our own staff too. And to that end, we shot some video footage yesterday with our uh, president of our medical staff, who's African-American, our chief medical officer, who is Latino, and our uh, medical interpreter manager, who uh, is Latina. And we're going to be um, editing those for use to encourage staff members. And it sounds like there's a need that we could also repurpose those for the community. So if that would be something you'd like to partner on, we, we can talk about how we might pull that off. Every little bit helps. Also to that end, um, our parent organization, Mass General Brigham, has been deploying vans with uh, clinicians who can go to communities and answer questions. And so to that end, we, were, we will be doing that today, actually starting half an hour in East Hampton at the East Hampton Community Center, and then again at 1230 in the Northampton Survival Center. But uh, best of all, for your side of the river, on April 7th, we are uh, coordinating to be there at the boulders at the same time as the Amherst Survival Center. Oh, that's great. We weren't sure we would be able to pull it off, but we did. The boulders agreed. So we will be um, having this van arrive. I don't know the time of day. I'm sorry. But uh, we'll have doctors and nurses and, and the medical interpreter and uh, some community health workers who will be there. Uh, also, one of the staff... I, at least today as a mental health professional, I hope they're there April 7th too, who can try to address concerns, um, you know, just answer questions. And ultimately people certainly have a choice on what they want to do, but we just want that choice to be informed. That's terrific, Jeff. Please make sure that legislators get both the video clip and the information on April 7th so we can promote it. Yeah, I, I don't know how we're gonna handle the video clip, but I will send whatever. And thanks everybody for all the great work that you're doing. You know, thank you, Jeff, for the, all of that. I just want to point out that the, um, when you were talking about people declining um, vaccine, some of some people may have seen that recently there were articles in the paper that showed that on the state level that a certain percentage of state police, as well as people who work in jails and prisons, are declining um, vaccination. And so that's going to be an issue, I would suspect, in the next week to two weeks about what to do about it. Right now, the governor, you know, there's a reluctance, and I think this is actually a healthy reluctance to require uh, vaccination as part of job because there's a lot of reasons why people don't. But I do believe this is coming from the HIV epidemic that there should be universal required mandated education about the effic efficacy and safety of the vaccination. That's what I'm going to be promoting is what are we doing about the state police and the Department of Corrections folks who are saying no, are we requiring them to go through education about why they should, because um, right now we're not doing anything. We're just saying there's a 30% declination rate and these are public safety folks who really should be vaccinated. So just as a FYI. Yeah. Are there, are there materials, fact sheets, videos where people are we're really addressing what people's real questions are who don't want the vaccination. I've seen materials um, from different hospitals actually throughout the country that have done that, um, where they have like fact and fiction. Um, I can start posting them on my Facebook page. People can see them there and then critique them. <laughs> and right. they, you know, this, this it would be better if they did X, Y, or Z. Um, but there are facts out there, um, you know, people who are very knowledgeable and experienced with issues around vaccine hesitancy have been very 
um, aggressive in trying to address the information gaps that may. I'd, I'd like to see those and, and see if they really come as if from people's real questions, not dictating to people and what they're supposed to do, which is mm -hmm. different. Yeah. You can also go to curlydickinson.org and um, <clears throat> we link to our parent company, uh, Mass General Brigham's website, and um, it's updated regularly, which is why we link instead of doing it ourselves. And uh, your comments are welcome. I can always feed them back to Mass General Brigham. I also have to a shout out, Jeff, to the Cooley Dickinson group. Um, anyone who has, who's on that in your medical portal has received notification from Mass Brigham also for vaccination. So I've had now, you know, multiple, multiple points of access. And um, so I'm deeply appreciative. I had someone come in who mentioned that that's actually how uh, the dad got in right away and got a vaccination appointment immediately. So um, things are working and uh, things are moving and that's that's really good news. I mean, I think that's the, the news we wanna hear. So um, thank you to Cooley Dickinson also. So, I mean, you guys have played an enormous role. So, and your staff, and you've taken enormous hits too um, financially. So it's been a long year. Are you all back to general surgery or is has general surgery come back at this point? Or modified pace or yeah i believe we are doing um everything we normally have done in the past at this point mm -hmm. yeah. right okay well that's good to hear i mean i think we want to talk about like we want to move toward the future but we still know we're in it you know this is still not over um and does anyone have any other questions for mindy or things you want to share or your concerns this is a good time to share a concern um you know or a challenge at this point, um, or a, hope, a hopeful statement for the future, <laughs> whatever you wanna share. Can I also just say, <laughs> if anyone is having a problem with unemployment insurance or other state services, they should feel free to reach out to my office. I don't want you to think that um, we work with uh, organizations and not individuals. Much of our work is actually with individuals. And so folks should feel free to call. Um, and we can at least track and monitor and make sure they have your paperwork and make sure they know that we have eyes on it. Um, as you know, there's a lot of people looking for unemployment. So the system is kind of sluggish, but um, we can push and we can nudge. Well, and I'm really hopeful. I, we lost Sarah Fedeker. She had to leave early, but she's from the five colleges. And I know our three more immediate Uni the university, Amherst, and Sarah's here with Amherst um, and Hampshire have said that they're working toward a full, you know, full return in the fall. And that would be, I mean, if we can get to that herd immunity and get to our return, that would be an enormous boost. Obviously for the chamber, we're here to look at our economic impact, right? And to see, but we can't look at this without looking at the dual health crisis. Like it's just all hand in hand and how we treat one another along the way. Um, but also how we move to get this. Um, thanks, Dawn. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy your day. <laughs> Enjoy the Berkshires. <laughs> She's away. Um, I love Zoom. Zoom, you can zoom in from anywhere. That is the beauty of it. Again, another silver lining. You can be away, but not really, and still join in conversations, which is really nice. Um, but, you know, uh, I lost my train of thought, but I think it, it is our race, as Mindy earlier said, to herd immunity right now. This is, the clock is ticking, but Mindy, you have been an amazing advocate for the vaccine and especially for the disproportionate um, rollout for um, underrepresented communities. And so I really appreciate you as, an, as a strong advocate as well. So, um, Thank you so much. Equity, equity here is, is a big piece of this. And, um, you know, it's, it's been really unfortunate that that is what COVID has really demonstrated as a lot of the inequities in our processes. So again, another impact, right? Another impetus for movement. So um, we do wanna be part of that. So I just wanna thank everyone, unless there's anything else anyone wants to share or ask of Mindy, I wanna keep us relatively on time. I wanna thank you, Mindy, for everything you do. Um, and I'm gonna say, yes, I'll send you another list for your next request. <laughs> for funding. So now that you say you're going for the next round, I'll be sending you a request list. But um, I mean, there's so much work to do now. Now is about rebuilding, resilience, you know, taking what we've learned, putting it to good use, you know, getting ourselves um, reconnected, new hugs, new, I mean, I'm looking forward to the hugging myself. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, you know, we've seen business owners, you know, having to 
uh, lay off their own family members throughout this. Like, you know, we are small. We, the heart of small business is, you know, you're in business with your family, right? Your family works for you. Generations work together. We've seen ki- people develop, you know, deliver food with their sons and their, you know, grandchildren. So I, I just love that. That's what family business, you know, these small businesses are all about. So it really is getting people and families back to work. So, um, but there is a lot more, I know medical leave, that is a big one. And we're gonna be talking as a chamber about the sheet recovery. We're, we're launching a women's, a new women's luncheon coming up um, in eight, at the end of April in a month and talking about going from the she session to the she recovery <laughs> um, and how disproportionately women have been impacted by the, uh, by the pandemic. So we are gonna delve into that topic at length. Um, and again, try to provide some inspiration too along the way. So uh, there's so much to to work through, but we're, and and we'll do it together. So thank you again so much for everything you're doing for our community, including your incredible um, not just creativity but flexibility, um, mm-hmm. and seeing you know what your programming can mean during the pandemic and bringing us all together this morning. But like all the ways that you do that, um, thank you for being such heroes, both you and John. Thank you so much. Well, Mindy, as we say, thank you for being in our corner. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Mindy. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you, Mindy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye Thank you very much. Bye, Mindy. You're, Mindy, you're the best. Thank you. You're the Bye, Mara. <laughs>